Alright. Okay. Radio. Hi. What's it like being a transgender dad? Yep. It's a make-believe role, I'll tell you that much for free. Let's listen. Due to copyright issues, I can't actually show the clip. See the link in the description box to hear what she has to say. For your benefit, I am simply going to speak what she spoke. And there are lots of ways to experience being genderqueer. There are also lots of ways to experience being a woman or being a man. Genderqueer is a redundant term. We don't need it. I believe in miracles. I don't really identify as a man or a woman. I feel in between and sometimes outside of this gender binary. That feeling she described is normal. It's normal because of one simple truth. Men and women, human beings, are not one-dimensional creatures. And masculinity and femininity are energies. Energies that exist and are expressed by both men and women. In a male, masculinity finds its home. In a female, femininity finds its home. Or in other words, the energy and the body can't be separated. No matter how hard you try. But both men and women have access to these energies to whatever extent and as necessary. The line, however, is going so far as to claim that you are in fact the opposite gender. A woman claiming she is actually a man or a man claiming he is actually a woman. The line is to proclaim you are that which you are not and to expect the rest of the world to agree with that delusion. Yes. But this in-between land is where I'm most comfortable. This space where I can be both a sir and a ma'am feels the most right and the most authentic. But it doesn't mean that these interactions aren't uncomfortable. Trust me, the discomfort can range from minor annoyance to feeling physically unsafe, like the time at a bar in college when a bouncer physically removed me by the back of the neck and threw me out of the women's restroom. Am I supposed to be shocked and appalled by this story? This woman did not get dragged out of the women's bathroom because she's transgender. She got dragged out of the bathroom because she's playing this game where she presents herself as the opposite of what she is and part of that game is wanting the rest of the world to look at you and either be confused about whether you're a woman or a man, or to conclude that you are the opposite of what you are. In this case, to conclude that she is actually a man. This is exactly what happened. In this story, all she's describing is exactly what she wants. She's being treated as a man. She was treated as any man would be treated if he were to wander into the women's bathroom. Best believe, if I was in a public women's bathroom, and some guy just walked in, I would expect that guy to be dragged out by the neck. Because he shouldn't be there. Authenticity doesn't mean comfortable. It means managing and negotiating the discomfort of everyday life, even at times when it's unsafe. Authenticity means genuineness. It means rightness, truth, legitimacy. It means factualness. It means credible. If this person was being authentic, they wouldn't be identifying as some kind of alien, genderqueer, non-binary. They wouldn't be raising a little girl to ultimately reject her own femininity, her own femaleness. They wouldn't be falsely assuming the gendered role of dad. Okay. And it wasn't until my experience as a trans person collided with my new identity as a parent that I understood the depth of my vulnerabilities and how they were preventing me from being my most authentic self. Again, being your most authentic self does not look like trying to change your nature. Being your most authentic self does not look like this. This is creating a whole new self, one which you feel more comfortable with. And that sense of comfort is fickle. 
it's fleeting. This woman, like all people who identify as trans or gay or any of the other names, has pursued a new self to cope with whatever it was that caused her in the first place to reject her own femaleness, to reject womanhood, to reject her nature. Now, for most people, what their child will call them is not something that they give much thought to. Of course not, because there's a natural order to things. Some things do not need to be taught. A child knows who and what you are in relation to them, and then they later learn the name that we have assigned for that thing. But the thing is the same. The thing doesn't change. It's just the language that changes. Outside of culturally specific words or variations on a gendered theme like mama, mommy, or daddy, papa. So the thought here that mum and dad are culturally determined terms, that the role of mum and dad are not objectively designated. This is horse manure. Mum and dad are not culturally determined. Like I said, the thing is the same, but the word you use depends on your language. Mum and dad are universal roles. Mum and dad are biological roles. Mum and dad are mum and dad because woman and man came together to procreate. These roles are in fact objectively designated. They correlate to your biology and to your biological role within a family unit. If this were not so, this person would not have opted for dad. The fact that she did reveals the necessity of the role of father. It also reveals the correlation between being male and being a father. Since this person has not only asserted herself as a dad, but makes herself to appear and behaves as if she were male, she were a man, she has taken it upon herself to act out the role of man in this child's life and in her relationship and standing here on stage talking to us all. Right. But for me, the possibility is what this child, who will grow to be a teenager and then a real-life adult, will call me for the rest of our lives, was both extremely scary and exciting. And I spent nine months wrestling with the reality that being called mama or something like it didn't feel like me at all. And no matter how many times or versions of mom I tried, it always felt forced and deeply uncomfortable. I'm just gonna read out what she just said. And no matter how many times or versions of mum I tried, it always felt forced and deeply uncomfortable. When I was 18, I met a girl who was mixed race. Her mum, I believe, was Caribbean and her dad was Irish. She went to a predominantly white, affluent school. And while she was there, her experience was that she felt deeply uncomfortable with the part of her ethnicity that came from her mum. She didn't identify with that part of her. Now, the reason for this isn't because she's actually, in fact, totally Irish. We wouldn't conclude that. We wouldn't conclude this because it's a fact that she is mixed. No matter how uncomfortable she felt with one side of her genes. So what would we do instead? Well, we would try and encourage her and help her to change her perspective or to become comfortable with her whole self, her whole identity, rather than encourage the discomfort as if it is who she truly is, that being totally Irish. That's one example. Another example is this. If someone is suffering from anorexia, if when they look at themselves in the mirror, they see someone who is totally fat and overweight. But when we look at this person, in reality, they're very skinny. They're dangerously skinny. What do you do with this person? This person genuinely believes that they are fat. But in reality, objective reality, they are not. They're dangerously thin. Do we tell them that they should have liposuction? 
that would make them feel better. That would make them more comfortable in their own body. Do we encourage the delusion? No, we don't. Again, we try to encourage and bring this person into an acceptance, a love for their whole self, their authentic self. We try to help them come back into alignment with objective reality. It's exactly the same when it comes to conversations about sexuality and gender. Yet, the world seems to have opted for encouraging the delusion. And everyone is going along with it because everyone loves their sexual immorality. And they don't want to let it go because they believe that it's part of who they are or it's totally who they are. So to bring it back, she said it felt forced and deeply uncomfortable. It felt forced and deeply uncomfortable for her to imagine her child calling her mum or any version of mum because mum correlates to woman just like dad correlates to man. So the fact that she feels this deep discomfort, the fact that it feels forced to her, isn't something we should encourage. We should be bold and confident in objective reality, and we should be loving towards such a person by way of correcting the thinking, not encouraging the delusion because it makes them feel better temporarily. Let's move on. I knew being called mom or mommy would be easier to digest for most people. The idea of having two moms is not super novel, especially where we live. So I tried other words. And when I played around with daddy, it felt better. Better, but not perfect. It felt like a pair of shoes that you really liked, but you needed to wear and break in. And I know the idea of being a female born person being called daddy was going to be a harder road with a lot more uncomfortable moments. That feeling she just brushed past is a very familiar one. It's this feeling of utter insecurity. It's a feeling, dare I say, all lesbians or what have yous know. It's this deep, undeniable knowing that no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you want it to be true, no matter how successful you are with the same sex, no matter any of that, you are not and you never will be a man. You will never break into those shoes because they simply were not fitted for you. And you will continue to walk down this road feeling this horrible insecurity, knowing that you do not measure up. It's like that education analogy where you have different kinds of animals and you tell all the animals to climb a tree. The monkey does it with ease, but the, I don't know, elephant can't because it just can't. It's not made to do it. So for the person struggling with their identity, their sexual identity particularly, they're measuring themselves, their self-worth, by a standard that simply does not belong to them. It's a different category. And so there will never be satisfaction in that pursuit. You're just running away from who you really are. You're running away from your authentic self. Just like this woman. I decided on becoming a daddy. And I've decided to become a bear. I am no longer able to work during the winter months. I will be hibernating. Leave me alone. I am trans species. Mark my words. If that's not already a thing, 100%. If we keep going down this delusional road, it's going to be a thing. There's going to be men and women on all fours walking around the street, nude, peeing on trees. And it's going to be normal. A stop it. And our new family faced the world. Now, one of the most common things that happens when people meet us is for people to mom at me. And when I get mommed, there are several ways the interaction can go. And I've drawn this map to help illustrate my options. 
So option one is to ignore the assumption and allow folks to continue to refer to me as mum, which is not awkward for the other party, but is typically really awkward for us. And it usually causes me to restrict my interaction with those people. Option two is stop and correct them and say something like, actually, I'm Elliot's dad, or Elliot calls me daddy. And when I do this, one or two of the following things happen. Folks take it in stride and say something like, oh, okay, and move on. Or they respond back, apologising profusely because they feel bad or awkward or guilty or weird. But more often what happens is folks get really confused and look up with an intense look and say something like, does this mean you want to transition? Do you want to be a man? Or say things like, how can she be a father? She can't, and it's genuinely confusing for everybody, including herself. Only men can be dads. It's genuinely confusing for a woman to claim to be someone's dad. This is not cultural. This is just reality. Women aren't fathers. Men aren't mothers. Women are mothers. Men are fathers. And if this woman was being authentic, she'd step up to that plate instead of devaluing that role by rejecting her own womanhood which is exactly what she's presenting to this little girl. Elliot, the daughter, is female. And what's being modelled to her by at least one of the parents, and encouraged and permitted by the other, is the normalisation of distorted personhood. Well, option one is oftentimes the easier route, option two is always the more authentic one. And all of these scenarios involve a level of discomfort, even in the best case. And I'll say that over time, my ability to navigate this complicated map has gotten easier, but the discomfort is still there. It's not going anywhere, because you're convinced, like many, like I was, that your authentic self has nothing to do with what you are. That instead, your authentic self is what you feel, though what you feel is entirely contextualised by your life experiences. But you ignore that link to the best of your ability, and so remain in this futility, striving to become something opposite to what you are, all in an attempt to cope with the traumas of said life experiences. Now, I won't stand here and pretend that's exactly what you're doing. Let's skip like 15 seconds. She talks about choosing between the two interaction options and then says this. But despite this risk, I know as Elliot gets older and grows into her consciousness and language skills, if I don't correct people, she will. I don't want my fears and insecurities to be placed on her, to dampen her spirit or make her question her own voice. I need to model agency, authenticity and vulnerability. And that means leaning into those uncomfortable moments of being marmed and standing up and saying, no, I'm a dad. I even have the dad jokes to prove it. Now, there have already been plenty of uncomfortable moments and even some painful ones. But there's also been, in just two short years, validating and at times transformative moments on my journey as a dad and my path towards authenticity. You're not on a journey as a dad. You're on a journey as a woman playing dress up and taking that game very seriously. Dangerously seriously. Selfishly seriously. Where does this journey take you? Well, it takes you further down the road of delusion until ultimately you are destroyed. You have no idea who you are. You don't even know where to begin picking up the pieces. You don't even know that there are pieces to pick up. You are in complete darkness. Gosh. When we got our first sonogram, we decided we wanted to know the sex of the baby. Why? You're just going to teach the child that their sex has nothing to do with who they are and perpetuate your own dysfunction, passing that on for generations. I hope your daughter says... No thank you. I am woman. So are you. The technician saw a vulva and slapped the words It's a girl on the screen and gave us a copy and sent us on our way. Yeah. 
What did you expect? You're saying it like the technician did humanity a disservice when you asked to know the sex. What was your expectation? Did you expect her to say, oh, you're having a non-binary human? No, you expected her either to say, it's a boy or it's a girl. How do we know? One has an ishki, the other as you stated, has a vulva. And there are other ways. We shared the photo with our families like everyone does, and soon after, my mum showed up at our house with a bag filled with pink clothes and toys. Now, I was a little annoyed to be confronted with a lot of pink things, and having studied gender and spent countless hours teaching about it in workshops and classrooms, I thought I was pretty well versed on the social construction of gender and how sexism is a devaluing of the feminine and how it manifests both explicitly and implicitly. Oh, implicitly? You mean like women denying their own womanhood and femininity, exampling to the child that being female is an undesirable extreme? Oh, right. But this situation, this aversion to a bag full of pink stuff, forced me to explore my rejection of highly feminized things in my child's world. You are the embodiment of that rejection in your child's world. I realized that I was reinforcing sexism and the cultural norms I teach as problematic. No matter how much I believed in gender neutrality in theory, in practice the absence of femininity is not neutrality, it's masculinity. If I only dress my baby in greens and blues and greys, the outside world doesn't think, oh, what a cute gender-neutral baby. They think, oh, what a cute boy. Gender isn't a social construct. It's an objective reality with energetic and aesthetic indicators that inform us which is which. There really is nothing funny about transgenderism, but here's something silly about it. Infuriatingly so. Transgenderism allegedly combats the big bad wolf of gender stereotypes, of the oppressive gender binary, while themselves socially constructing gender. Transgenderism doesn't move away from the gender binary that is a social construct. It enforces gender as a social construct, one that prompts you aggressively oftentimes to move away or straight up run from your own biology. It's so unhealthy. It is so not loving yourself and being your authentic self. It's literally annihilating your authentic self to be something else. And this is what the world teaches your children to do. So my theoretical understanding of gender and my parenting world collided hard. Yes, I wanted a diversity of colours and toys for my child to experience. There are no female or male colours. There are just colours. Without external input or attribution, pink and blue are just two of many, many colours. A boy playing with something pink and fluffy is just a boy playing with a toy he finds amusing. Unless the adults around him decide to share their input with him. Their input that a boy playing with a pink fluffy toy is girly. This woman's fixation on the colours of toys and clothes she allows her child to wear or use will hold only the meaning she ascribes to them. The child will learn inputs from their parents' outputs. When we treat children like this, we are reinforcing false ideas about what it means to be a man and what it means to be a woman, or what it means to be masculine and what it means to be feminine, which are the very same ideas this woman seems to desire to reject and protect her child from. Interesting. I want a balanced environment for her to explore and make sense of in her own way. We even picked a gender-neutral name for our female-born child. But gender neutrality is much easier as a theoretical endeavour than it is as a practice. Intentionally skewing the child's perception of her own sex. Colours are one thing. This raising children as gender neutral, this is something else. 
This is something destructive. This is something abusive. There exists, whether you are comfortable with it or not, a binary. The very pulling away or rejection of one's birth sex proves the significance of the binary. What you are matters. If it didn't matter, this wouldn't be a thing. And in my attempts to create gender neutrality, I was inadvertently privileging masculinity over femininity. So rather than toning down or eliminating femininity in our lives, we make a concerted effort to celebrate it. We have pinks among the variety of colours. We balance out the cutes with handsomes and the pretties with strongs and smarts and work really hard not to associate any words with gender. The reason we would typically associate some words with either of the genders can actually be quite reasonable. The biology of men and women are different. The reason, say, a woman might naturally have wider hips than a man, or that men are typically stronger and taller than women, is due to our biology. So describing a man as, say, voluptuous, voluptuousness or being curvy is typically biologically a female characteristic. Wide hips are even a biological practicality because women bear children. So there's a reason why certain words are typical in our language when describing men and describing women. It's not necessarily always the case, but there is a basis for using particular words to describe one or the other. And some of these words, like handsome, for example, were used of women back in the day. There's just too much of an importance placed on this. Your identity can't rest on such things. Your identity can't rest on such things that are subjective and changing. We value femininity and masculinity while also being highly critical of it and do our best to not make her feel limited by gender roles. And we do all this in hopes that we model a healthy and empowered relationship with gender for our kid. What creates limitations in a girl is discouraging them from living securely in their nature. True of boys too. Now this work to develop a healthy relationship with gender for Elliot made me rethink and evaluate how I allowed sexism to manifest in my own gender identity. Did it though? Because you're still implicitly indicating that to be a man or to be masculine is more desirable. I began to reevaluate how I was rejecting femininity in order to live up to a masculinity that was not healthy or something I wanted to pass on. Doing this self-work meant I had to reject option one. I couldn't ignore and move on. But that's exactly what you're doing. You come to this awareness that you're rejecting your, your femininity, you're rejecting your femaleness, that you're actually perpetuating sexism only to continue exampling self-rejection to this little girl. You came to the wrong conclusion. You didn't even come to a different one. I had to choose option two. I had to engage with some of my most uncomfortable parts to move towards my most authentic self. And that meant I had to get real about the discomfort I have with my body. It's pretty common for trans people to feel uncomfortable in their body. And this discomfort can range from debilitating to annoying and everywhere in between. And learning my body and how to be comfortable in it as a trans person... So close. You can't be comfortable in your own body so long as you insist on being a trans person who meets your estranged life partner what? I've always struggled with the parts of my body that can be defined as more feminine. My chest, my hips, my voice. And I've made the sometimes hard, sometimes easy decision to not take hormones or have any surgeries to change it to make myself more masculine by society's standards. The whole society's standards thing is such a cop-out. So sick of hearing that. Like, it's got nothing to do with society. It's biology. Like, men and women are, by nature, different. Our biology is different. It's so insanely simple. Man and woman have to come together in order to create more men and women. And those men and women who 
produce more human beings, they always, they consistently have the gendered roles of mum and dad. A father does not bear children. Women bear children. Women have wombs. Women carry the baby for nine months. Women give birth because they're physically capable of doing that crazy act. And then women, because they have breasts, produce the necessary sustenance for this new life, etc. These are not society's standards. This is objective reality. It's the biology of women and the biology of men. And while I certainly haven't overcome all the feelings of dissatisfaction, I realised that by not engaging with that discomfort and coming to a positive and affirming place with my body, I was reinforcing sexism, transphobia and modelling body shaming. Look, let me be abundantly clear. It's not because you're wearing a suit. It's not because you have short hair. A woman can wear a suit, a woman can have short hair. It's the whole ensemble. You aren't just a woman in a suit. You're a woman with the intention of presenting yourself as a man and further as a dad. And one way you've attempted to do this is by the way that you dress and the way you have your hair. You're obviously still ashamed of your female body. You're still deeply uncomfortable in your body, no matter how you present yourself or what you call yourself. And it'll always be that way till you change your mind, until you listen to reason, until you conform to objective reality rather than expecting objective reality to conform to your feelings. You're still modelling sexism to your daughter, favouring men over women. If I hate my body, in particular the parts society deems feminine or female, again with society. If anything, society's on your side these days. I potentially damage how my kid can see the possibilities of her own body and her feminine and female parts. If I hate or am uncomfortable with my body, how can I expect my kid to love hers? Now, it would be easier for me to choose option one, to ignore my kid when she asks me about my body or to hide it from her, but I have to choose option two every day. For whose benefit? Really? The mere fact that this person decided to bring a child into the reality of her gender dysphoria is utterly selfish. I have to confront my own assumptions about what a dad's body can and should be. Oh, here we go. So I work every day to try and be more comfortable in this body and in the ways I express femininity. So I talk about it more, I explore the depths of this discomfort and find language that I feel comfortable with. And this daily discomfort helps me build both agency and authenticity in how I show up in my body and in my gender. I'm working against limiting myself. I want to show her that a dad can have hips. A dad doesn't have to have a perfectly flat chest or even be able to grow facial hair. Everything she relates to femininity and masculinity has to do with aesthetics. It's so interesting because she's trying to say that it's not about how you look while presenting herself as a man. Classic men's haircut, bulky suit, referring to herself as dad. And she probably likes it when her wife calls her husband. Enforcing all of this onto everyone, including a two-year-old child. Yes, a dad can have hips. A dad doesn't have to have a beard. A dad doesn't necessarily have to have a flat chest. Because he might have a few pounds on him. Because the way you look, or the way you present yourself, isn't what determines what you are. Boys always become men and men become dads because that's their biological potential. Girls always become women. Women become mothers because that's their biological potential. And when she's developmentally able to, I want to talk to her about my journey with my body. I want her to see my journey towards authenticity, even when it means showing her the messier parts. Wow, how wildly inappropriate and self-absorbed. And then she gives us another real life example. She talks about two paediatrician nurses. The first is called Sarah. She tells Sarah about their situation. The second is called Becky. Becky was not told about their situation. There comes a point where they're all in the same room and Sarah refers to this woman as dad in the presence of Becky. Becky corrects Sarah 
and Sarah corrects Becky, leaving everyone in an awkward moment. Again, this is like the example of a bouncer throwing her out of a women's bathroom. Maybe Becky thought you were a lesbian couple. She sees you, a woman, trying to look like a man. Maybe you're a lesbian. Sarah isn't a hero. Sarah has been previously informed of your confusing situation, of your make-believe identity, and unfortunately, she goes along with it. She was therefore equipped to refer to you the way you want people to refer to you. Becky didn't get the memo. You walk into a room, you're met with confusion, because you're confused, and it shows. What you feel on the inside, and what you believe about yourself in your mind, is being expressed intentionally, aesthetically, and by the manipulation of language. Unfortunately, we live in a world that refuses to acknowledge trans people. What world are you living in? Transgenderism is everywhere. It's forced onto parents. You're in schools. You're paraded shamelessly in the streets. You're on TV. In music. You are literally stood on a stage, being hosted by a globally recognised organisation, an educational channel, talking about your experience as a transgender parent. What refusal? And my hope is that when confronted with an opportunity to stand up for someone else, we all take action like Sarah, even when there's risk involved. Why can't we assume that Becky was standing up for you? Like, why is it wrong that Becky advocated for you as mum and not dad? You're not a dad. And you're running away from your womanhood. It doesn't matter if you allow the colour pink into your house. You yourself are presenting to the world and to your kid that you are, for whatever reason, rejecting womanhood and femininity. And you are advocating sexism. So, what's it like being a transgender dad? Yep. It's confusing and selfish. I want to revisit one statement she made. So I work every day to try and be more comfortable in this body and in the ways I express femininity. So I talk about it more, I explore the depths of this discomfort and find language that I feel comfortable with. And this daily discomfort helps me build both agency and authenticity in how I show up in my body and in my gender. I'm working against limiting myself. I want to show her that a dad can have hips a dad doesn't have to have a perfectly flat chest or even be able to grow facial hair. Here's what I believe is happening in this dynamic. This woman has deep-seated identity issues that stem from beliefs about being a woman, especially being a woman in relation to men. These beliefs are not good, but they correlate to her life experience, making them valid. This woman now has a little girl. This little girl is serving this woman's unconscious need, her unconscious desire to heal her primary relationships, mother and father. This woman is projecting her brokenness onto this little girl. In that, she wants the little girl, who is actually the little her, to know that it's okay to feel this way. She wants to tell her younger self all about this journey and this struggle that she's on, because she's still experiencing discomfort, the discomfort she has felt all of her life. She's talking to her younger self as a way to self-soothe. It is an attempt to cope, not deal. Because if she can make this external girl okay with her, she believes somewhere that she herself will ease her little self, who's crying out for healing. This is not going to work, because the obvious conclusion, the real discomfort, is not being addressed. The feelings are being acknowledged, but the cause of the feelings are not. And so her little self is still being neglected, because her big self, her adult self, is selfish and afraid to deal. Her resolution is to pursue better feelings, not authenticity, not truth. The what we are and the who we are were made for each other. This is what authenticity looks like. You correlating with your nature and the wider natural and supernatural world around you. Okay, bye. My name is Christ Defender. I defend the Christian faith. I answer questions and criticisms concerning Christianity. If you like what I do and you would like to support me, hit the Patreon link in the description below. If you're not too sure yet, but you're intrigued, hit subscribe, turn on notifications, check me out. Okay, bye!